Hey guys, Potates here, bringing you some more artifact information thanks to Eurogamer. If you're unsure what artifact is, check out my information video detailing everything you need to know in the description below or at the end of the video. It's currently in closed beta with only around 100 people participating. In essence, Artifact is a Dota 2 themed card game designed by the creator of Magic the Gathering, Richard Garfield. He noticed that Magic the Gathering wasn't optimized for the digital experience and... Wait, what am I doing? I'll just let him and the lead programmer on the game, Jeep Barnett, explain it to you. Well, my, my games tend to run into one another and separating uh, um, failed designs from stepping stones towards a game. Uh, a finished game is uh, hard to do, but uh, I first began thinking of electronic trading card games basically uh, as soon as Magic came out and we realized uh, how inadequate it was for uh, electronic play. And uh, um, so since then, uh, I've been working uh, uh, I'm ever, constantly, off and on, on, uh, on different designs that would uh, try to bring what was so exciting about uh, uh, trading card games on, into the uh, electronic world. So from what he says, it's clear that Richard has been working on a solution to the digital card game genre for a while. I literally just played a round of Magic before recording this, and I have to say, this solution would be sorely needed. From what we can see, it seems Richard has done a good job, but is his job over? Uh, Scaff and I as a team are pretty constantly, mostly uh, Scaff is here and I come in uh, at this point once a week, uh, something like that. Um, in general with games, my biggest input is at the beginning with the design. Um, and uh, and uh, so back in the day, I was here much more. Did they give you wheelie desk? I don't know if there were wheels. We, I was moved around a lot, I know that. <laughs> so no, his job's not over. He'll be a continual source of creative direction, which is good to hear. So what about Ice Frog, the creator of the original Dota mod and the secretive influencer of Dota 2? Has he some impact on this game? So we've had him come in and play the game and he, he likes it a bunch. And uh, he uh, is pretty focused on other stuff right now, especially Dota. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, he hasn't weighed in too much on the design. He's just been somebody who's enjoyed the game from the side. It seems he won't be getting his hands dirty on this title and fair enough. He designed a completely different game and it seems Artifact is in good hands. So speaking of the team, will the Dota 2 team build upon the universe in Artifact? Yeah, so Steve, our, our writer, he's, you know, worked on Saints Row, the good ones, and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so he, he's really awesome and has done a lot of writing both for Artifact and for Dota. And in a bunch of the recent updates that they've been shipping, uh, he's been kind of setting up some of the, the lore that's going to play out into this game. So setting up uh, some of the characters and some of the places that are going to be featured. There's an overall story where the, the cards are created within the Dota universe and it's kind of a mysterious reason why they've been created. But within the first set, um, what we're exploring is this big three-way battle between these factions. So there's the uh, Bronze Legion, uh, who are trying to defend their home city from the Red Mist who is invading. Uh, and the Bronze Legion has uh, set up an occupation inside of uh, this Vool city, which is kind of this forested city. And the Vools are cooperating with them at first, but then the leader of the Vools, Rix, um, sort of re rejects uh, the, the occupation and starts a rebellion. And so it's a struggle between those three factions. And uh, within further sets, we're going to continue to expand. Um, like the, the outcomes of what happens within this story will affect what happens in the next set and what happens in that set and how those characters change will affect the set after that. So besides the fact that it's going to have a story to tell which is interesting on its own and definitely something that will draw in players and immerse them, there was mention of evolving lore affecting new sets and heroes. Does this mean a hero card may, for example, change in the new set? So you, you see this in, in Magic and uh, in a bunch of other card games, but characters that you see in one set will have a new version in another set where either they've grown or they've you know, become a zombie or they've... Uh, you know, gain some new magical hat that does a thing, you know, or they a sword that they used to have now that they're dead, somebody else has that sword, things like that. So the game will grow and change based on the ongoing storyline. Perhaps Axe loses his axe and has to fight bare-knuckled Kratos style in the next set. Sounds interesting, and I can imagine class-exclusive cars will change to suit the new sets. 
This could mean that balance can be implemented in a way that doesn't phase out a hero completely, not sending him to Wild or the Hall of Fame or even banning him. I wonder how they will tell the story though. Besides being in game, will there be another outlet? Yeah, so, so um, the way we tell stories in every game that we do is a little bit different. Like if you look at Portal or Left 4 Dead or anything else, like we really um, try to tell the story in a way that uh, fits best with, with the gameplay uh, and tell the story through the gameplay. And so with this, all the characters and units on the board uh, we treat as you know, real characters uh, who talk to each other. So if you get you know, Legion Commander and Axe uh, together on the same side, uh, they'll be like, you know, with our powers combined, we can take over this. And, uh, but if you get them on opposite sides, then Legion Commander will be like, Axe, you betrayed us. And so it's really about um, uh, every time you play, you see a new combination of, of characters you hadn't seen before. And they expose sort of a new piece of the story and how they relate to each other. There's also thousands of lines of lore. Mm -hmm. uh, each car has their own lore. So uh, they're also audio recorded. Um, after you're done with the game, you can go to Axe and just like, hey, I want to hear the lore for Axe. And there will be like an except for that. And that with like spells, items, pretty much everything. Uh, so it's actually very lore rich, the game. As soon as I heard that Dota 2 heroes will be chatting to each other like they do in, well, Dota 2, I was sold and forgot almost everything else he said. This feature in itself will do wonders to keep the game fresh and interesting. Even spectators will enjoy this. I found Magic Arena was a bit lacking in the sound design. What separates a good game from a great game is the sound, and it's something subtle and subconscious, but I have faith that Valve is taking this aspect seriously too. When compared to Hearthstone, Magic Arena falls over a bit in that department. I remember the exact sounds playing, and people like Disguised Toast have made whole channels based on the sound design in Hearthstone. So how will Artifact hold up? Hearthstone uh, does an amazing job for uh providing a game for a, a, a limited screen space and a, 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 a short amount of time. Um, and one of, the, one of the things we were designing Artifact to do was provide a, a broader, more open-ended experience because when people go from Magic to Hearthstone, they often, uh, while they often like Hearthstone a lot, they often uh, say that they wish that there was the variety that uh, Magic offered. And so we tried to take all the bounds off the game that we could. So there's no hand size limit. There's, you can have uh, huge numbers of creatures into play, in play. Um, and, and, uh, and the play state changes radically throughout it rather than, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't clear constantly like it, uh, like it will in, in Hearthstone. Um, I think that, uh, that, uh, that when people play first hear about it that's going to be the natural comparison but once they play it they're going to see that it's uh, you know as different as poker and bridge right it's very very different <laughs> games they're, they're both games that have cards in them but they're yeah. pretty different um, yeah another thing that's very different is uh, so so in magic um, whenever you play a card you have to wait to see if the other player is going to react um, this sort of has a version of that where we take turns back and forth I play a card you play a card I play a card you play a card and so anything that I play, I know that you have a chance to react and do something um, about that. And so the order that I play the cards in is very, very important during my turn. And also uh, thinking about what cards you might play to disrupt what I'm doing is very, very important. And it, it makes quite a bit of difference between them. This is exactly what I was hoping to hear. This means that Valve and Richard haven't created a game to be like Hearthstone or Magic. They've created something with an entirely different objective. Artifact will aim to bring a rich tactical experience, but also be optimized for the digital setting. Since there's no hand size limit, multiple fronts, and there's regenerating heroes, it means the scope for tactics and well, different decks is much higher than any other card game at the moment. We find that most card games fall into a set amount of meta-defying decks that, when played against each other, follow a set format. If this deck draws first, then it wins. Whereas if you were to take two completely identical decks in Artifact, there's a range of strategies you can employ and each game can and will be different. You can in turn play cards that might be in a way to bait something out. You may switch up where your heroes are deployed, what lane they're in, how you will achieve victory and so on. The most interesting thing is the unlimited board space though. So can you essentially fill up one side of the board with thousands of cards? 
your computer's RAM is the limit, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the board basically, it turns into a little conveyor belt where you can drag and, and see all, all the, the hundreds of, of creeps that you've, you've generated into a lane sometimes. It depends on the type of combo deck you've built. Some decks really want to go wide, and some are just like, I want to make one hero really, really beefy and just hit the tower once, and that's it. So, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a fun story that we, we have a coworker, Dave, that <laughs> likes to test the limits of things. He just likes to try and break things. And this was a, a couple of years ago when the game was like much earlier and still not uh, optimized. He manages to get a board with, I think, something like 20,000 creatures. Wow. Uh, but the game was going so slow at that point because <laughs> it wasn't optimized. He kind of left it overnight to see, and then he came back the next day and the game finished and he won. He <laughs> said, okay, the game won. <laughs> it took like eight hours, but it did the thing. 20,000 cards. Well, I'm glad that they have optimized now because eight hours for a turn gives me some Shadowwalk PTSD. For those who don't know the Shadowwalk Hearthstone combo, look it up on YouTube. So items are yet another thing that adds strategic depth. You give your hero an item to adapt to the situation. Say he has a lot of blockers against him, you could get an item that lets him pierce through the blockers and damage the tower directly. Say it's a big creature blocking, you could give him an item that instantly kills that creature when he's damaged. Lots of possibilities and I found items were one of the main reasons Dota 2 was a lot more strategic than Heroes of the Storm. A game I find never really lets you adapt to the situation as much as you would like to as an individual. Back to card games though, one major reason I get frustrated in card games is the random effects RNG. For example, I mentioned I played a game of Magic right before recording this. In that game, I paid in-game currency to buy into a mode. I was um, in both games dead in the water because I didn't draw a land card once. Lands are needed to play your other spells. And in Hearthstone, you have tons of random effects like hitting random targets and there are a ton of fails of the day YouTube clips because of this RNG and I guess that's what makes it fun for some people. But what is Artifact doing to combat this? I think that uh Randomness has a really important uh, place in games and is a, uh, um, a uh, unfairly maligned mechanic. Um, but it, it has to be used correctly. And, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but when you when you put it into a game correctly, uh, there's, it, it increases the variety of situations you come up with. Uh, it'll uh, make it so that, uh, that you sort of have to constantly be on your feet. Um, I think it's very understandable why it's maligned because a lot of people uh, go into games because they want an environment they have control over, which doesn't often describe life so well, and so it uh, undermines one of the one of the things they really like in games. But if you go into games for uh, uh, strategic interest, uh, interest in strategy and, uh, and, and sort of interesting situations, uh, then, then using that as a tool can really increase the, uh, you know, what, what you've got. Um, one of the things I really love about Artifact is that for anything that, there, that is randomized, there's a way that you can build your deck to mitigate or control that randomness. And so just as an example, where creeps randomly deploy to different lanes, there are heroes that allow you to control where those creeps deploy. Or f when the direction that you're going to attack is randomly assigned, you have cards that can allow you to change which direction you're going to attack. And so it's sort of built into the play style of if you want to have a lot more control over the game, you can have that. But you're also forfeiting other cards that you can play instead of those. It's a really interesting trade-off to choose which of those types of strategies you want to focus on. They raise good points. RNG does add some fun to games, but it's good to know there are ways to mitigate and control the randomness in the artifact. No more effects like get a random spell out of hundreds of cards. The randomness that will be in artifact will be, well, two creeps deploying a lane, for example, and drawing a random card at the start of the turn, which is entirely different. It seems artifact will be gearing up to be a tournament ready game. But to do so, there has to be a good amount of fans, and, well, we know gamers aren't liking the whole pay-to-win mechanics in games of late. Game Newell has come out saying he doesn't like pay-to-win either, but wouldn't Artifact be pay-to-win in its nature? I mean, uh, uh, you can call golf pay-to-win because there's better racket, better clubs, better rackets than uh, <laughs> you, you can get, but, uh, and, and they will affect your chances, uh, but, uh, but nobody would call it, really call it pay-to-win. Um, 
So what, what we do with magic is we uh, make sure that, uh, that, that the decks that are winning, we, we understand what the cost of those decks are. And, uh, and we don't want those to be uh, prohibitively expensive. And, and, so, and so that means that we want a lot of common cards that are generally useful and, uh, and that the rare cards are uh, often finish it off and add some spice and a little, a little bit of extra oomph. But uh, by doing that, you can control what a cost of a deck is. But uh, if you have real trading in the game, uh, your investment can be moved around uh, from one deck to another pretty easily. And uh, um, and yeah, so uh, we uh, you have to avoid this thing where you just kick in money and you get a better and better chance to win. And that's what, what, the, what the, the way a, a well-designed game in this space works, I think, it is more of a logarithmic curve. You, uh, you, you get enough cards that you can have some flexibility and, and uh, after that you're up in the golf, golf club range. And, and you know, it's like, and that can also be convenience because you don't want to do a trade, do trades, things like that. So not mentioned here is the fact you'll be able to trade your cards in Steam's amazing marketplace. If you haven't used it, you should check it out. Basically, that means that each card you ever open digitally will have real world value, unlike in other digital card games like Hearthstone, Magic Arena, Gwent, Elder Scrolls Legends, and so on. So yes, you can pay to get packs, but the decks you need to win will be given specifically to you at the start. And if you want a specific strategy, you can trade for it. The game won't be free to play. At least that's what Gabe has stated. He mentions the reason being is that when you make things free, their value drops. When referring to trading in marketplaces, that makes sense because people can just open new accounts, get the cards, trade, flooding the market with those cards and making them worthless. So not being free to play is refreshing and knowing Gabe, I'm sure they'll give you plenty of cards and decks to start you on your artifact experience. So that's the interview and a bit of new information from the horse's mouth. I don't know about you guys, but I'm extremely excited for artifact. It seems like the card game we've all been waiting for. Strategic, deep, fun and interesting to watch and play. So what do you think? Tell me below in the comments, are you looking forward to this title? Are you hesitant? Stay tuned to Potates anyway for all your latest artifact news. Thanks for watching guys. I had a lot of fun making this video and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe and click that little bell below. And if you haven't already, be sure to join my Discord. It's full of fantastic like-minded individuals and you get to talk to me directly as well. So I'm Potates and I'll see you next time.